And it was so exciting to, to visit with uh, people, leaders of different churches. Very popular today to say, I love Jesus, but the church, forget it. And it's easy to knock the church. If you can't criticize the church, you're not even trying. Because the church is made up of sinful people. And the amazing thing to me is when Jesus said, I will build my church, he knew exactly the kind of people he'd be working with. So he redeems us, he calls us his own, and we have freedom to criticize the church, and there's a lot that we can criticize, but don't let your criticism blind you to the fact that God is calling out a people for himself, purifying them, and it's the, it's the bride of Christ. It's the body of Christ. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this church here. And that's what Titus is about. It's written to a young man who is a ministry associate of the Apostle Paul. He has left him on the island of Crete. And there are all these little churches that have sprung up in these little towns scattered all over Crete. And Paul sends this young man in and he says, this is not an easy place to be a Christian. This is not an easy place to, to have a church. And I need you to go in and strengthen those churches and put things in order there. And the first thing I want you to do, and John talked about this last week, is I want you to appoint elders. I want you to appoint leaders in the church because leadership matters. Speed of the leader, speed of the team. Everything rises and falls with leadership. And if a church is weak in its leadership, it's just weak, period. So what Paul does in those first few verses, verses 5 through 9 in in Titus, is he says, here's the kind of people you select as as leaders in the church, and here's what they do. They feed God's people, and they lead God's people, and they protect God's people. And that brings us to the passage we're going to look at today, the text, Titus 1, 10 through 16. And I want to read this. If you would stand for uh, the reading of God's Word. He says, for there are many who are insubordinate or rebellious, your version might say, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans or people from Crete are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Wow, that is strong language. But this is God's Word, and we praise Him for it, and you may be seated. So Paul says, hey, in those little churches, there are some people causing problems, and you need to silence them. And that word literally means to, like, muzzle a dog. You need to muzzle them. Shut their mouths. Does that make anybody nervous here to hear that? I mean, he's saying churches should muzzle some people, shut their mouths, and that just doesn't sit well with many of us. It certainly doesn't sit well with our tolerant, friendly, go along to get along, let's agree to disagree kind of a culture. And if you're here and you're a skeptic or you're a little cynical about church, this may actually lead you to say or to think, that's what I've always thought about Christians. Always, what I've always thought about churches, they're all about shutting people down who don't agree with them. They're, all, they're intolerant of people who are different, not in lockstep stop, uh, step with themselves. Christians are about silencing disagreement, dialogue, debate. They're about, about correcting people, producing cookie-cutter Christians. They, they enforce this dogma that everybody has to believe just exactly the same thing. That's what I've always thought. There it is. I just want to say to you, if that's what you're thinking, you could not be further from the truth. 
Because the Apostle Paul, all through had his ministry, welcomed debate, welcomed dialogue, welcomed discussion. And in God's church, we are to have that kind of a freedom. But there's a difference between healthy debate, healthy dialogue, healthy discussion about doctrine and church things, and unhealthy conversations, unhealthy debate. There's a difference between people who are earnestly seeking to know the truth and people who are rebellious. And that's what he's talking about here. I've noticed that when, um, whenever in a Bible class or maybe a, a, a discussion around the coffee, uh, the coffee pot or a, a water cooler, and people talk about the Bible or they talk about doctrine or they talk about uh, theology, s- some people can say some really dumb things. And I'm the prime <laughs> example of that. I have said some really dumb things in terms of in, in Bible classes. And I have learned that when people are talking about the Bible say dumb things, the best thing to do is not to jump on them and beat them down, but to find some place where we can agree and then let the truth correct them. But Paul doesn't say that. What Paul says is this. The people who are causing problems in these churches in Crete are not saying dumb things. They are saying wrong things on purpose to confuse people and deceive people. Big difference between someone who's earnestly trying to understand the truth and someone who's trying to cause confusion and deception. These people are teaching error on purpose, he says, and they're tearing up entire families. I mean, they're tying families that are in, in, in turmoil. I want you to look at the kind of people he's saying that, that need to be silenced in, in, in churches. Verse 10, he calls them rebellious or insubordinate. They're unwilling to submit to authority. That's what a rebel is, isn't it? A rebel is someone who won't submit to the authority of the government or submit to the authority of a school teacher or submit to the authority of, of parents. In fact, it's the same word that's used up in verse 6 when he talks about a child who's out of control. People here are not just honest seekers of truth. They are, they're not people with questions who, and doubts, and they're looking for a place to hash those questions out and try, try to find the truth. No, no, no. They're people who don't care about truth. They're people who have an agenda. And you know those people are around today, right? Some people like that. In fact, there's a little rebel in every one of us. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where Satan told that first couple, said, you don't have to do what God says. You don't have to believe. He doesn't have to be your authority. You do what you want to do. And there's a little of that in each one of us. When a person becomes a Christian, they submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. And they say, Jesus is Lord now. He's the authority of my life. That's what it means to be a Christian. He also calls them empty talkers. This is not the kind of person you want to have over for dinner because they're not interested in conversation. They just want to hear themselves talk. Winston Churchill once talked about people who, he said, some people regard silence as a challenge. (laughs) Oh, he's had a way with words, didn't he? Book of Proverbs says in Proverbs 18, too, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. Wise people ask questions. Wise people want to discuss so they can understand. A fool just wants to debate, air his own thinking. There's a difference. And there are people out there like that, right? Some of them are in political office. Some of them have radio programs. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are on television. And he calls them deceivers. And he says they're of the circumcision party. And friends, just a little hint. Anytime there's circumcision, it's not a party. <laughs> He's talking about people who are, uh, who are in the churches, and they're telling people, it's good that you believe in Jesus, but if you really want to be right with God and for God to, to accept you, you've got to believe in Jesus plus, and you've got to keep all the Old Testament laws, or today we would say you've got to have good behavior, you've got to do this or that. They, they're teaching what I call the Jesus plus plan that Jesus himself is not enough. And what Paul is saying is you got to shut those people down because anytime you add something to Jesus, you subtract Jesus entirely. So he says these people aren't just, they're rebellious, they're empty talkers, they're, they're deceptive. And he says they're motivated by money. You ever notice that false teachers love to talk about money? They're always talking about money. They're always seeking to use the ministry as a platform uh, to make themselves 
uh, wealthy. They crave money. First Timothy 6 says they suppose godliness is a mean to, means to great gain. So these churches are really struggling because all this stuff is going on. They, they're, they're in turmoil, and it all has to do, look at verse 14, it all has to do with people who have turned away from the truth. So here's the big idea this morning. Truth matters. The Bible wants every one of us to know truth matters. There's truth and there's error. There is right and there is wrong. And Paul is saying when you see people, God's people, being led astray by deception and untruth, you need to step in, you need to address it. Nothing could be more countercultural to the time we live in. Nothing could be more against the grain. I, I want to take just a moment. I don't do this very often, but I want to read to you an editorial from three years ago, written by a philosophy professor at, the university, at a university in Colorado in the New York Times, March the 2nd, 2015. Here's the writer. He's a, he's a father. He's a professor of philosophy. He says this, what would you say if you found out that our public schools were teaching children that it is not wrong that that it what would you say if you found out that in our public schools are teaching children that it is not true that it's wrong to kill people for fun or cheat on tests? Would you be surprised? I was. As a philosopher, I already knew that many college students view moral claims as mere opinions that are not true and are true only relative to a culture. What I didn't know was where this attitude came from. A few weeks ago, I learned when I went to visit my son's second grade open house. I found a troubling pair of signs hanging over the bulletin board. They read, fact, something that is true about a subject and can be tested or proven. Opinion, what someone thinks, feels, or believes. Hoping that this set of de definitions was a mistake, I went home and I googled fact versus opinion. The, de the definitions I found online were substantially the same as the one in my son's classroom. As it turned out, turns out the common core standards require that students be able to tell the difference between facts and opinions. So what's wrong with this distinction and how does it undermine the view that there are objective moral facts? Well, for one thing, he says, things can be true even if no one can prove them. For example, it could be true there's life elsewhere in the universe even though no one can prove it. And conversely, many of the things we once proved turned out to be false. Many people once thought the earth was flat. How does the dichotomy between fact and opinion relate to morality? I learned the answer to this question only after I investigated my son's homework. Kids were asked to sort out facts from opinions and without fail, every value claim is labeled as an opinion. Any claim with the words good, right, wrong is not a fact. Here's a little test. Are the following facts or opinions? Copying homework assignments is wrong. Cursing in school is inappropriate behavior. All men are created equal. It is worth sacrificing some personal liberties to protect our country from terrorism. It is wrong for people under the age of 21 to drink alcohol. Drug dealers belong in prison. The answer, in each case, the worksheets categorize those claims as opinions. In other words, each of these claims is a value claim, and value claims are not facts. This is repeated ad nauseum. Any claim with good, right, wrong is not a fact. In summary, our public schools teach children that all claims are either facts or opinions, and that all value and moral claims are fall in the latter camp. The punchline, there are no moral facts. And if there are no moral facts, there's no moral truth. The inconsistency of this curriculum is obvious. For example, at the onset of the school year, my son brought home a list of student rights and responsibilities. Had he already read the lesson on fact and opinion, he might have noted that the supposed rights of other students were based on no more than opinions. According to the school's curriculum, it certainly wasn't true that his classmates deserved to be treated in a particular way. That would make it a fact. Similarly, it wasn't really true that he had any responsibilities. That would be to make a, va a value claim a truth. It should not be a surprise there is rampant cheating on college campuses. If we've taught our students for 12 years, there's no fact of the matter as to whether cheating is wrong. We can't very well blame them for doing so. 
Indeed, in the world beyond grade school where adults must exercise their moral knowledge and reasoning to conduct themselves in the society, the stakes are greater. Their consistency demands we acknowledge the existence of moral facts. If it's not true that it's wrong to murder someone with whom one disagrees, how can we be enraged? If there are no truths about what is good or valuable or right, how can we prosecute people for crimes against humanity? If it's not true that all humans are created equal, then why vote for any political system that doesn't benefit you over others? We're being told there are no moral facts in one breath. In the next, we're being told how we ought to behave. That editorial makes the point. Truth matters. It's one reason I love the Bible. Because when you come to the Bible, you move out of the madness of our culture and the confusion of our culture, and you move into the bright light of truth. Because it is God's true revelation of himself. Truth matters. That's what Paul is saying here. And if that's the case, I want to quickly say three things based in this text. Number one, because truth matters, we must embrace the truth. And because truth matters, we must challenge untruths. And because truth matters, we must devote ourselves to the God of truth. Let me take those just one at a time real quickly. If truth matters, then we must embrace the truth, which means Christians are truth people. We love the truth. We believe the truth. We embrace the truth, whether we, it's popular in our culture or whether we fully understand it or whether we, uh, it, it goes against it. Wherever we find truth, we embrace it. There's this little line in verse 12. Did you catch it where he says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That comes from a Greek poet 500 years before the birth of Christ, a guy by the name of Epimenides who lived in Crete and who said this about his own people. Here's a modern rendering of that. Liars ever, these men of Crete, nasty brutes that live to eat. Now imagine you're in church in Crete on Sunday morning and Titus stands up and says, hey, we got a letter from Paul. What's he say? Well, he says, all of you are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Welcome to church. Hope you feel affirmed. Well, I'm sure that not everybody on Crete was a liar and an evil, lazy glutton. But Paul says, this testimony is true. In other words, this is generally true. It's like the book of Proverbs. It's, it, it's generally a, a true facts. And Paul is saying this. Here's a pagan poet who knew nothing about Christ, maybe didn't even believe in God, and he spoke truth. So we'll accept it because truth is truth. Wherever you find it, all truth is God's truth. Did you catch that? All truth is God's truth. Whether it comes from someone who's a Christian or not a Christian, all truth is God's truth. If it's true, then it's true. And the opposite of welcoming the truth, we're to welcome the, the opposite, is verse 14, people who turn away from the truth. And I want you to notice this is willful turning away from the truth. This is intentionally turning away from the truth. This gets at the core problem of the human race. This goes below the surface to what our deepest problem is. The Bible does not say that our problem in life is ignorance, that we, we need more information, more data, more more facts. The Bible says we are rebellious and we need to repent and turn toward God. The problem is not that we don't know the truth. The problem is we don't believe it. We don't welcome it. We don't embrace it. Listen to Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The problem is not that we've forgotten the truth or we don't know the truth. We're, we suppress it. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Friends, our problem is not that we don't know the truth. Our problem is we've suppressed it. We've exchanged the truth 
for what is not true. That's our core problem. And so the Bible just cuts through all of our excuses. Well, I don't know, or I'm not sure I believe that. Or No, here's reality. We know who God is, and we've chosen not to worship Him. That's the reality. The problem is not ignorance. The problem is our will. We turn from what we know is true. When God in His grace and His mercy opens our eyes to this, helps us to understand our rebellion against Him, and we trust Christ, and He redeems us, He changes us from people who suppress the truth into people who welcome the truth and embrace the truth and love the truth. So here's my question. Do you welcome the truth even when it's not popular? Even when it doesn't fit any preconceived idea that you have? Do you think if it's true, I want to know it? I want to know how it impacts my life. I want to know how, what it does in my family. Because truth matters. So we must embrace it. Here's the second thing he says. Because truth matters, we must challenge untruth. So he says, all these rebellious people who are going around creating all kinds of havoc in these churches, you've got to silence them. And he says, verse 13, the Christians who are listening to these people, you've got to rebuke them. So he says, you're fighting on two fronts, Titus. You've got to deal with all these false teachers out there, and you've got to deal with people who are listening to them. He says, you got to sil- how do you silence a false teacher? How do you silence someone who is willfully, purposefully trying to deceive people, creating confusion, deception? How do you silence them? One is you don't give them a platform. And he tells us in verse 9, back up last week, what John taught, you raise up leaders in the church who understand the truth, know the truth, committed to truth, and who are able to teach the truth, and you overwhelm error with truth. Which is why I'm so excited about the fact on Wednesday nights and Thursday mornings, we're teaching men and women theology. And we're teaching Old Testament on Wednesday night. Well, I'm so excited about the fact that we're doing all this construction in here, putting in those classrooms, so on Sunday morning, more and more truth can be taught from God's Word. And that's why I'm so excited that we've adopted a people group who is up to now unengaged, unreached, two and a half million people lost, will be lost forever, and we're trying to find ways to get the truth to them. In ways that they can grasp it and understand it. And why I'm so excited about the fact that as a church, we support church planters, and we try to revitalize stagnant churches because the truth matters, and you can overwhelm error with teaching truth. And he says, all those people who are listening to all this stuff, verse 13, rebuke them sharply. That bother you? (laughs) How do you take rebuke? How do you take a sharp, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. A lot of us have bought into our culture's lie that says, my feelings deserve to be honored at all costs. I don't want to be challenged or corrected at all. And if someone speaks to me that way, they're not being loving. Besides, aren't we called to be gracious? Yes, we are called to be gracious. But grace means sometimes you have to be confrontational. Grace means sometimes you have to speak up and say, no, that's not right. While we were in Spain, we we're in Barcelona, and, and uh, we were watching our grandkids play out in this park. They're playing soccer. And uh, the ball went rolling into the street. And Vinny, the youngest of our grandchildren, at least there in Spain, took off after it into this busy street. I'll tell you what I did not say. I did not say, Vinny, I care deeply about your feelings at this point. I don't want to speak harshly to you. I'm hoping we can have a quick dialogue about setting some boundaries about relationships with streets and so that we can arrive at this shared understanding of when a ball goes in the street, how you're going to react. So if you can find time on your calendar, let's sit down and have this. Dis- no, I didn't do that at all. I said, Benny, stop. Stop now. And he stops. And after we get the ball and bring it back on the playground, then we can talk about what's going on there and, and why you don't take off running. Sharp rebuke is not always unloving. Sometimes it is the loving thing to do if you care for people. Especially when, when it's poison, they're believing, and they're acting in light of 
poison. No good parent is tolerant and broad-minded about kids playing with poison. And untruth is poison. And it not only wrecks people's lives now, it sends them to hell. So sometimes you, you just have, there just has to be a, a sharp rebuke. Can we decide together, friends, can we decide together to welcome rebuke? Can we not be the kinds of people that when someone wants to talk to us, no, you got to say it the right way, you got to say it the right time, I got to get my coffee first. And can we not just be the kind of people who say, someone loves me enough, cares for me enough to tell me the truth and to point out where I'm acting in a way that's contrary to the gospel and it's destroyed, self-destructive in my life. You go, well, what if a, true, a rebuke is not deserved? I mean, sometimes you get rebuked and you don't deserve it. Can we not say, boy, that was harsh, but I, I think they had my best interest at mind. Paul says, when you rebuke, you do it so the people will be sound in their faith. That's what the text says. Can we agree that truth matters so we embrace the truth, we welcome the truth wherever God's truth And can we say, when needed, God in his good grace puts brothers or sisters in our life who will speak into our life, and sometimes it's hard to hear, but it's an act of love. Here's the third thing. Because truth matters, we devote ourselves to God's truth. You see, verse 14 says they were not devoting them, they were devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commandments of of people. Question. What are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? Work? Hobbies? Uh, Political party? Family? Whatever you are devoted to has the power to dominate you, the power to to, to, to master you. Whatever you are devoted to, you give it authority in your life to exercise control over you. And sometimes we devote ourselves to things that are not bad. They're just not central. They're not primary. You know anybody who's devoted to end time prophecy? <laughs> Israel, Iraq. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it all figured out. That's all they can talk about. You know anybody who's devoted to um, politics? Jesus is a Republican. <laughs> Jesus is a Democrat. Jesus is a Libertarian. I mean, every politician recruits Jesus to support his cause, right? You know anybody who's devoted to tolerance? I mean, believe anything you want to as long as it doesn't impact your life. As long as it doesn't do anything for you. What are you devoted to? Because truth matters. The Bible says we're, devote ourselves, we're to, are to devote ourselves to, to God. These people are devoting themselves to, he says, Jewish myths and commands of people. In other words, they're devoting themselves to the Jesus plus plan. If you want to qualify for God's grace, if you want to walk with God, if you want to be saved, you get good, you believe in Jesus, good, but you got to add all these other things to it. And Paul is saying, that's the anti-gospel. That's untruth. That's poison. That is deceptive in every way. And I just want to challenge us because it is so easy to drift into this. As Christians, we know better, but we drift into thinking, oh, you got to believe in Jesus and you, you got to do all these things. You got to behave in, in a certain way. So easy. And maybe, maybe this morning, God's just saying, you know what? You need to go back and you need to repent and once again return to the fact that it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus only, not Jesus plus something else that gets you redeemed, that gets you into his grace. Because if it's Jesus plus anything, if you add anything to Jesus, you subtract Jesus. That's no gospel at all. Then he talks about when the pure, if you you have a pure heart, everything around you is pure. If you don't have a pure heart, everything is defiled. How do you get your heart pure? How does, and he says, these people are defiled. And some of us sit here and go, you know what the truth is? I'm defiled too. My heart's defiled. My heart, my mind is defiled. How do you get pure? How do you get your mind, your conscience cleansed? Well, some people will have to say, it's Jesus plus 
this or Jesus plus that. Here's the reality, friends. The only way that we become pure is we turn to the only one who can be pure and was pure. Think about what it means to devote yourself to something. Devote yourself to God. Devote yourself means to commit yourself. And you come into the presence of someone who is truth, and all you see is error in you. The closer you get to God, the more you see I'm not what I should be. All those construction guys doing the work over here, they're doing, and the painting that will be done, it will be done in, under terms of, and the contract will read under terms of normal lighting, because if you brought a spotlight in and you put it on the painting that is done, you'd see all kinds of little problems there. You come into the presence of the spotlight of God and His grace and His truth, and all you see is the ugliness or the, the sin or the error in your own life. How do you deal with that? What do you do with that? You turn to the one who said, I am the truth, the one who never ran from the truth, the one who, though he was truth, was falsely accused, hung on a cross, and died for untrue people like me and like you. And you turn to the only one who has the power to purify us. I want to tell you a story. Go ahead and put that picture up on the screen, if you would, please. While we're in France, uh, we met the guy on your left, on the left, the guy who's kind of looking away. His name is Fata. Um, he's born in Algeria. He's a Shawi. He's from the people group that we're trying to pray. How, how do we reach them? And by the way, I've got to do a sidebar here. And this next year, we're going to try to send three or four teams of people, small groups, who will go to Marseille, France, and walk among the Shawi people, walk in the streets, and pray for them. And if you'd like to go on a trip like that, spend three or four days in Marseille praying for these people that God will open their eyes to the truth, please let me know, putting those trips together. This man is a Shawi. Um, Here's his story. In 1991, he was interested in the Quran and especially all the stories about the prophets in the Quran. And he kept reading in the Quran that Jesus is the greatest of the prophets, even greater than Muhammad. And he just quickened his imagination. He wanted to know more about Jesus. And he heard a radio broadcast about Jesus being, the, being God, being the, 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 the Son of God. And he sent a letter, at that time, no email, he sent a letter saying, could I hear more about Jesus? He's there deep in Algeria. Uh, and it took 15 days to get a response. Finally got a response back, and then a little brochure talking about how you can come to know Jesus personally. And he accepted Christ as his Savior all on his own there in Algeria. He thought, he really thought he was the only Christ follower in all of Algeria. And he heard about another Christian from another people group 300 miles away, he got in his car and he drove there and he said, we spent all afternoon, this other Christian and me, talking about what we had learned, talking about Jesus. He went to a training event, learned how to share his faith and began to talk to other Muslims in his community about Jesus. And soon he had 15 people meeting in a little house church. 15, he baptized several of them. They become followers of Christ. In 2005, the government of Algeria passed a law that forbids anyone to, quote, shake the faith of a Muslim. When he married his wife, his mother-in-law cursed him. And he was forced to leave Algeria, move into France. He's now a policeman. And he is so joyful. He's so excited about Jesus. Because he moved out of confusion and darkness into the light. And the man's heart was just full of love for Jesus. He told us a story about another shy woman who became a Christian and for 20 years said nothing to anybody about it. She was so afraid of persecution and being disowned by her family or being poisoned by her family for 20 years. And she was living with her mother and her mother was getting elderly and she was afraid her mother was going to die without hearing about Jesus. So one day she screwed up all of his, her courage and went in the kitchen and said, Mom, um, I, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> and her mom smiled this great big smile and said, I am too. <laughs> and I haven't told anybody. It is the power, it's the power of Jesus to 
to change people who have been swamped in untruth. Bring them into the bright light. Forgive their sins. Give them the freedom now to come into his presence knowing I'm fully accepted. And it's not because of anything I have done at all. It's because Jesus was my substitute. Died, not only my example, but my substitute. Died in my place. And he's my only hope. Their lives are changed.